last week was the highest sales of CDs we've ever had in one Sunday morning. I'm not sure what's going on here, but it's a good thing. And last week, I spoke on fatherhood. And obviously, the Lord got through to some of us. This is one of those unscheduled interruptions in our program. And I want to talk about honoring fathers in this segment. First Corinthians chapter four. First Corinthians chapter four. Our session today is going to be focusing on how fathers earn honor. Men are quick to tell women, God told you to honor me. But I want to talk about whether you deserve it. And we want to focus on this very important subject today. Write this down, please. How fathers earn honor. How fathers earn honor. I was looking at a magazine the other day and I was reading this article about foundations and I saw this picture, a beautiful picture of a house, fantastic house and the windows were perfect the doors were immaculate and then they showed on the next page that the house had no foundation a house without foundation is condemned When God created the human race, God was building a house. That's why God doesn't dwell in temples made by men's hands. Because your body is the temple. The human family is God's temple. And I've come to this conclusion. You may want to write this down. The greatest crisis in national development is not lack of money or lack of investment or even crime and unemployment but behavioral scientists have proven that the greatest crisis in national development of any country is the absence of fathers in the nation and in the home this has been proven scientific studies. There is no substitute for father. Please write that down. Because we are beginning to see people redefine marriage. And in some cases they say a child can have two mothers. But there is no substitute for fathers. Please write these three statements down. Number one, a teacher is not a father. There are people who teach you things in life. Don't confuse them with being a father. Number two, a guardian is not a father. You may be assigned to stay with someone to bring you up 
But it doesn't mean that they can take the place of father. And number three, a friend is not a father. You may have been brought up by some friend or some relative. And they've done good things for you. But they can never take the place of father. Matter of fact, how do you identify a father? I thought I would put this picture up because sometimes you teach things and they're not working in your own life. Uh, that's my son on the camera a moment ago. Here he is, handsome guy. First Corinthians chapter 4. Please get your pen, find this verse, and underline it. Because this is where I think we've made some mistakes. We have confused a teacher with a father, or a guardian with a father. But let's read what God's constitution says about a father. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 17, verse 15 rather, says, even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, some translation says teachers, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ I became your father through the gospel. Therefore I urge you to what? Imitate me. Now this is important. When you go to school, and you have a teacher, you don't need to imitate the teacher. You just simply take what they give you as far as the lesson and you go home. You don't want to be like the teacher. So how do you identify a father distinguished from a teacher or a guardian or a friend? Here's how. The father is the person who tells you, do what I do. Say what I say. Be like me. Dress like me. Act like me. Go where I go. You have many teachers, he says. Many guardians. But you lack fathers. The Bahamas has a reputation of letting other people bring up the kids now. Huh? Especially on the family islands, we dump our kids on Grammy. Or some step somebody. Or some uncle or aunt. The Bible says you can have many teachers, many guardians, but you still need what? A father. And a father is not a person who teaches you. Anybody can tell you what not to do and what to do. But for them to be with you long enough so you can imitate them, that is a different story. Write this down. A father is the one who is present, observable, and you can emulate. See, you cannot imitate who is absent. And I can tell you now that most of the men in this auditorium today, if you use this definition, they never had a father. They had a guy who slept home and was gone before they woke up. A father is the one you can imitate. You cannot imitate who is absent. You can imitate who is observable. I ask you a question, men. Would you want your kids to do everything you're doing? Even the secret stuff? Should they imitate your behavior? 
the words you use, how you act toward women who are not your wife. Should your son imitate everything? Observable. Here is what the Bible says about fathers. I call it the divine imperative. It's found in Exodus 20, verse 12. It says, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord God is giving you. And then it says in Ephesians 6, New Testament, repeats it. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. That it may go what? Well with you, that you may enjoy long life on the earth. I mentioned to you in the last session that God ties honoring your father to living long. And this is not magic or even a miracle. It's a social reality. If the fathers do their job, there'll be no crime so kids won't get killed. Huh? If fathers were doing their jobs in your country, the jails would be empty. God is tying honoring father to lifelong living. Which would mean that the death rate in a country must be related to the absence and the dishonoring of fathers. I thought that this therefore may lead to the next point. Why we need fathers. Number one, why do we need fathers? Because God sees fatherhood as the solution to all human personal, social, and national problems. Can you imagine that? All of our social ills, God says, is tied to the absence or the abuse of or by fathers. Let me read his statement concerning a national curse. It's found in Malachi chapter 4 verse 6. God says, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the hearts of the children back to their fathers or else I will come and strike the land as the nation with a curse. The word curse here is the same word used when Jesus spoke to the tree. You remember the tree? He went to the tree for something to eat and the tree was supposed to be bearing fruit and it was fruitless and he simply spoke death to the tree and the next morning the tree was dead. They call that a curse. Curse means when God speaks words that manifest and they are not positive. When a land is seemingly under a curse, and I guess we're beginning to feel that, our murder rate for the year in the Bahamas has already caused shock waves. And we're only halfway through. In Jamaica, it's ten times worse. In Trinidad, they got kidnappings and murders. And we think, what's the problem? God says, there is a death spirit, and the death spirit is related to a curse on the land and that's related to the fathers not being with their children and the children not coming back to their father. If I was to become Prime Minister today my first act that I would write and sign would be a national men's policy for developing all Bahamian men. And I mean that and I would put money in that program and encourage all males in the Bahamas to be retrained and be refathered. And I would establish programs and projects to help men restore their spirit of fatherhood. Because once they do that, then the crime becomes zero. Can it be? that we have been focusing on the wrong thing. Look at Psalm 68. 
verse 5. You definitely want to underline that verse in your Bible. It says, A father to the fatherless, the Lord shall be, and a defender to the widows. Now notice, God is describing some problems. He said, there are folks who are widows, and widows in those days were people who really were like on welfare. He says, for those on welfare, those who got poverty problems, he said that he will defend them. He said, but when it comes to the fatherless, they don't need money, they need a father. And the last statement in this verse is amazing. He is a father to the fatherless, he is a defender to the widows, is God in his holy dwelling. He sets the lonely where? In families. If you are unmarried, we call it single, which is not correct, but if you are unmarried today, God says, you don't need to shack up with a lesbian or homosexual to be loved. You need a family. And if you are 38 or 90 and you ain't married, God says, don't prostitute your life. Find a family. Connect with a family. Because family consists of a father and a mother who can nurture you even at age 40 to keep you sane. He places the lonely where? In families. And keep in mind again that father doesn't mean it has to be your biological daddy. Paul told Timothy, I am your father. I believe that's why God sent so many men to this ministry. We got some of the largest percentage of men in this church. Why? Because God knows my heart. He has put in me the spirit of a father. And the men that sit in these chairs, you don't know where they came from. The history of their lives. I saw men at this altar last week weeping. You have no idea what each tear is about. You have no idea. It will blow your mind if they told you what the tear was about. He places the lonely in families. Look at Psalm 103 verse 13. As a father has compassion on his children so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him he didn't say as a mother has compassion he said as a father has compassion we normally think of women having compassion God says no a father is supposed to be a compassionate spirit women are supposed to be feel safe with their fathers compassionate Incest is supposed to be unheard of in the home of a good father. And that could be an uncle who's supposed to be a father or a nephew who's supposed to be a father. Whoever's abusing you is not a father. Get out of that place. Because a father has compassion. Has compassion. I noted this. The Bible says, do not curse your father. Honoring your father protects you. And cursing your father is self-destruction. Let's read this verse one more time. Matthew 15 verse 4 says, For God said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. That means it's better for you not to be around than to curse your parents. Look at Proverbs 20 verse 21 or verse 20. It says, if a man curses his father or his mother, his lamp will be snuffed out in pitch darkness. Notice that everything is ready to death. Death when you dishonor a father and a mother. Which means that if you honor them, it protects your life. But I think the big question is, what is honor? And why should we honor this person? And do they deserve honor? And how do you honor? It's very important. Why honor a father? First of all, the word father is the Hebrew word Abba. 
and it means source, sustainer, foundation, it means root, it means genetic pool. Matter of fact, the word that is used in the Hebrew is progenitor, progenerator, the one who is the supporter of genes. The father is the foundation, the source of life. God says, honor your source, honor your sustainer. I guess if you look at these words and think about your father, some of you don't have a good definition anymore, do you? Was your father a foundation for your life? Was your father like a root that you could hold on to and when the storms come, you stay steady? Was your father the one who was the provider and the source that you could depend on to supply you with what you needed all your life? Is your father the genetic pool you're proud of? you proud to be related to that person? Are we ashamed of our fathers? I heard a young man say it one day, he says, I am so sorry I have my father's genes. That was the most depressing statement I heard for ages. But God can become your father and give you new genes. And that's the good news. God can restructure your chromosomes and give you a new genetic pool. I want to, to give you a definition of honor. I think it's important. And you want to write all these words down, especially the women, because you want to know what it means to honor a father. All the young men, how do you honor a father? And especially the fathers, this is what honor means. I did the research for you, and the word is a loaded word. First of all, the word honor means to respect. Secondly, the word honor means to esteem. Thirdly, the word honor means to admire. Fourthly, the word honor means to encourage someone, to inspire them. Fifth, the word honor means to elevate to lift somebody up. Six, the word honor means to magnify. That means to make big praises of the person. Six, the word honor means, seven rather, means to celebrate someone. To honor them means you celebrate them. You talk about them all the time. The word honor means to brag on someone. When you honor someone, you talk about them and you brag about their achievements and their goodness and their character and their qualities. Number nine, to honor means to appreciate. Honor your father. Appreciate. And then number ten, the word honor means to recognize. Now, let's put these words in a sentence and see how they work. When it says honor your father and your mother, be focusing on father, which is the foundation. It means Respect your father, esteem your father, admire your father, encourage your father, elevate your father, magnify your father, celebrate your father, brag on your father, appreciate your father, recognize your father, and you shall live long. That's a lot of work. Question, how many fathers deserve that list? How does a man earn that list? You are not a father because you have a baby. Dogs are puppies. We don't honor them. Any sperm that collides with an egg at the right time will conceive a child. Whether it's a roach, a rat, a dog, or a man. Fathering is different from biological conception. Think about you as a father. Look at that list. And by the way, your wife's supposed to do this list to you also. Does she respect you, honor you, esteem you? Does she admire you? Oh my God. Does she elevate you? Does she magnify the little things you do? Does your wife celebrate you around other people? Does your wife appreciate you publicly or does your wife say if they only knew if 
Is your wife keeping your secrets from us to protect you? Because your mask is so big, she hoped we never see what's behind it. Are you sitting here this morning with a wife who was quiet, but she knows the truth? This is a tough teaching, but a necessary one. Now, I want to make something clear before we wrap this session up, because we got to continue this next week. But I want you to write this down. I want to give you the difference between a father as a position and a title. The word Abba which we translate as father oh this is so important number one now let me just say that God was talking about honoring the father not necessarily a person let me explain what I mean fathering is a position and a function not a title and a name I repeat Father is a position and a function, not a title or a name. You know, many people in the Bahamas have problems, some have difficulty, when we say that the father of our nation was Selinden Oscar Penland. Some people argued that for months when it was announced. Because they didn't like the person. Didn't like the personality. Didn't like what they knew perhaps about the person. But father is not the person. It's the position and the way they functioned in birthing and sourcing the child. He gave his life for the Bahamas. Whether you like it or not, you know it's true. He sacrificed his family for the sake of your family. I guess my question to the men would be, are you functioning? You know, we love to walk around and say, I'm the, I'm, I'm the father. That's the title you're trying to get. No, you're looking for the position and the function. Are you functioning? That's my child. Really? Well, that's that dog's puppy. Are you functioning? That's my son. Are you functioning as a father? It's not a title. Matter of fact, Abba is a description of a function. When something comes out of you, you're supposed to source it and sustain it. And that identifies you as the father. Whoever sources you, sustains you, protects you, preserves you, guides you, is an example to you, who you can emulate, that's your real father. And sometimes your father is not the person in the house. Because they don't hardly be there. They don't function. Number two. The position and function must be honored. If the father, whoever that is, is functioning, you honor that position. You know, at the moment, our prime minister is functioning as the father of our country. So no matter what your politics is, you may not personally like this person, but you got to honor the position of prime minister. You got to respect that. You have to esteem that position. Why? If you demean the position, you've destroyed the power and authority of the position. I think what's important here to note then is positions never go away. People do. So you respect the position. 
Number three, fathers must earn the right to be respected and honored. That means there's something they must do and a position they must hold. Position, I would say, is you are present, you have access or accessible, they can find you if they need help and advice and counsel, they are accessible to you and then you must function as a source. And the average person sitting in this room didn't have a father like this. Very few people. And that's why God wants to teach this, to bring us back to our sanity. Number four, to honor fathers imply that fathers can be dishonored. You know, if God makes a command to do something, that means it also could not be done. Am I right? If God said don't lie, that means you could actually tell the truth. Hello? And if God says tell the truth, that means you actually could lie. If God says to honor your father, it also means that there must be possibilities of not honoring him, which means that he must do something to deserve dishonor. You're not supposed to be honored because you just happen to supply the sperm. <laughs> you are supposed to be honored because you functioned and earned the right. You are fulfilling the duties of father. You don't need to be the biological person. As long as you are in a position and you are functioning, God says you are the father. You know, Abraham fathered an entire nation. He's called the father of the nation. Why? He functioned as the source. And he read that boy, Isaac, who read uh, Esau and Jacob, who read Jacob's twelve sons, who read the nation of Israel. In other words, for one man, he sustained him. He brought that boy up. He taught him. He trained him. He mentored him and made him a believer in Jehovah just like him. And then he had two sons and he taught him what his father taught him. And they kept saying, I believe in the God of my father. That's why he's the father of nations. Not because of biology. Because of functionality. I challenge us men today. To deserve honor. Earn it. I want to just wrap up on the father's model. You know, uh, I'll write this down. This is very important for the men. We have a big crisis, guys. I know you agree with me on this one. The greatest crisis for men is the absence of fatherhood models. Am I right? Hey, guys. Yes, we can't find models of good fathers. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we, we buried your father, Mr. Ambrister. Everyone called him dad. Do you know why? He's the most steady man I know. He'd been around a thousand years. When I was a baby, I knew him in South Street. They lived right across from us through, is it M M McQuay? M yeah, McQuay Street right across from us and from a kid from a little four-year-old I knew this man and he was always a steady hard-working man how old was he when he died 86 he would have been 87 this this month on Father's Day you know he was always present am I right one thing you say about him he was present and then when he came a member of this church, he's one of the oldest members of this church. We were just young kids when he became a member. And he came to every meeting possible. Some of the young kids came once in a while. But that old man would make his way here. He wanted to be in every service. He was a father. It's hard to find models, guys. You know, most of the men in this room don't want to be like their father. You don't. Some of you actually wish he wasn't your father. Well, you're not alone. You got stuff like that all through the Bible. That's why God gives you fathers. He says you have many teachers. Some fathers just want to teach you things. Boy, how are you doing in school? Yeah, put your pants up. Yeah, but daddy, I don't see you. How come you instructed me and I don't see you? 
You want to be a teacher, but you ain't a father. You done your homework? Dad, help me with my homework. Two different instructions, eh? Teaching, do your homework. Fathering, let's do your homework, son. That's what the kids are missing. They don't need no more teachers. They're teachers all day. When they come home, they need a father. A father sources. He sustains. He encourages. He, he, he embraces. He has compassion. You know who hurt the most in this all this scenario? Is the women. Because a woman cannot tell a good man if she didn't have a good father. Her assessment of males is defective because the model was impressive. And then the male don't know what a good father looks like because the model was impressive. So make a note of this right here. A man cannot deliver what he never had. Now this is where we get into problems with relationships, eh? A woman wants a good man. The problem is the man was never trained to be good. So you're saying, why don't you? Why don't you? And the guy's saying, but I can't, I can't. And she says, well, why don't you? He said, because I don't know how. Love me. How? He says. Just love me, she says. He says, how? I saw my daddy beat my mama, girl, for 30 years. How do I just switch this thing? He never held my mother's hands before in the presence of our kids. I've never seen my father kiss my mother. You want me to kiss you? Are you crazy? I kiss you at the wedding. That's enough. In other words, the guy don't know. There was no model. Some of you, you think men are cold. They ain't cold. They were trained cold. They had a cold experience. You don't talk to me. Well, my daddy never talked to my mother. I don't know how that looks. And here you are. You want him to talk to you. And the guy said, I don't know what to say. I was told by my daddy that you must be the strong, silent type. A man's supposed to be silent and strong. Your strength is in your silence. That's the silliest advice in the earth. But men are taught that by the wrong models. Men teach things like this. If she gets out of hand, let her feel your hand. And your father would tell you that, son. Now you're getting married, you got to keep them in check. What does he mean by that? He's training you to beat a woman. And then she says, love me. And he says, I can. I have no morals. Gentlemen, I want you, if, if, you, if, if you're married, I want you to force yourself to not be like your daddy. Hug your wife in church. Put your arm around a chair. I mean, make it force yourself. Hold her hand when you walk in the parking lot. Hold her hand. Hold my hand, woman. Why? You want to break the curse of that cold spirit. <laughs> Kiss your wife in public in front of your old girlfriend. Kiss her deep. <laughs> Why? You got to break that spirit. That your father put on you. The Bible says the sins of the father falls on the third, fourth, fifth generation. Cold men were produced by cold men. And then they marry a warm woman. You ain't cool if you don't hug your wife. You ain't cool if you don't hold her hands. You know, she cooking at the kitchen, just walk behind a pat on her hip. Hey, baby. You made her weak. She'll go into shock and tell her, I don't want no sex, I just love your shape. Men cannot deliver because they never received. Matter of fact, this next point is important. We demand from men what they cannot give. And that's the hard part for the women. You keep telling the man, talk to me. Let's just talk. And the guy says, about what? To spend this evening with me and do what? Let's go for a job. Why? Let's go for dinner. 
That's too much money. I mean, the guy just, it's, it's just problems in his head. And so she basically realizes that this marriage is really about eating at the table for 20 minutes, sex in the bed for two minutes. Yes. And he gone to bed. And in the morning he asked, did you pay the light bill? That's it. That's just waiting. That's marriage for most people. It's just this maintenance talk and, you know, getting some, some experience with sex. That's all. Because they have no training about how to father a wife. That's why you're suffering. Some of you women here, you are 40 and unmarried because you're still looking for this father. This, this model, this, this person who, who could treat you with honor. And they're hard to find. My father always kissed my mother around us. Always hugged her. He was always holding her hand. He'd make breakfast for her. And we grew up watching this. He run the tub for her. I'm like, and now I'm doing the same thing to this woman right here. See, see? My father was a model. It wasn't strange. He would hug us and kiss us. And my son, that he'd tell you, I still hug him. He hugged me. Why? Because father, the Bible says, Jesus says, my father loves me. He says, he says, my father loves me. How can a big son like Christ say that? My father loves me. Most men don't know if their father loves them. Never been hugged by their father. Never been kissed. Oh my God. The Bible says, kiss the son. So the father may rejoice. Talking about Jesus Christ. Kiss Jesus, yes. He ain't no sissy. A kiss is an expression of love for someone. It's tough for men. Write this down. What, what do you do if your earthly father was a failure? And we're going to deal with this next week. Don't miss the session. What do you do what? I can't hear you. If your earthly father was a failure. And you know this morning if he was. I gave you definition. You can sit here right now and figure him out. Yep. He was not a real father. He supplied the sperms, but he didn't father me. And this goes for men and women. Well, here's what Jesus said. It's a solution. He says, if your father on earth wasn't a good father, then he says in Matthew 5, 48, be perfect, therefore, as your father in heaven is perfect. You got a model. You can pick it up here next week. And I'm going to show you the model. You're going to be so amazed of how wonderful it is to be a good father and to be with a good father and to find a good father. Brother, it ain't hard to be a good father. It's just that we haven't had the model. I'm going to show you the model and for the next two weeks we're going to look at specifics in the model. How to be a good father. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day.